Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit is alive and well in this place today? We are in a study called Spirit Life, and man, the Bible says pray in the Spirit, pray in understanding all the gifts, all the fruit, all the fullness is ours. Would you tell somebody next to you, it's yours for the taking? Let them know that. Some people are missing out on all that God has for us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Welcome back, Tim and Angel, man. These guys had a real real battle, and, and what a joy it is to see them. And all of you that are visiting with us and are tracking with us online, welcome to today. And we are in part four of our study called Spirit Life. And as we continue in this study on the Holy Spirit, we're going to do so this morning by looking at how God equips us for his call on our lives. Aren't you thankful for that. And, and, and as it's been said for many years now, you know, God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. That he sends out a call. He sees something in each of us. And the reason he sees that is because he put it there. And so he calls that out and says, I have called you for this. And even when we don't see it in ourselves, he sees it and he qualifies us to accomplish all that he's called us for. If you have your Bibles, turn over to the book of Zechariah towards the end of the Old Testament there. You will find this book of the old prophet Zechariah. And we're going to read chapter 4 today. So they're going to put it up on the screen so you can follow along easily this morning. And you're saying, we're going to read a whole chapter. Yep. And here's the way it goes. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. Let's stop right there for a moment. How many of you have been just jarred out of a deep sleep? You, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you with kids and they come in in the middle of the night just when you're in that good sleep zone, man. You're out of it. Nothing in this world that you're oblivious to everything. And all of a sudden, bam, mommy, I'm hungry. <laughs> So Zechariah saying, I, I'm awakened out of this sleep. So man, he, you know, he, he stirred up and all of a sudden the Spirit of God wakes him up. Let's continue on. And here's what, what happened. The angel who came to him said, he asked me, Zechariah, what do you see? And I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other is on its left. And I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Okay, go ahead. Next, verse 5. You're just going to leave me hanging? Huh? <laughs> I'll go to my Bible then. That's where I should have been. Okay, verse 5. The angel who talked to me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now this is, this is a guy we're going to talk about this morning named Zerubbabel. Anybody in here named Zerubbabel? I didn't think so. We don't use these kind of names anymore. He said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says who? Says the Lord Almighty. So you got to know this is extremely important. So, so God brings this message. Let's go on down to verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? That's easy for me to say. You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. Now, now get this. His hands shall also, what? Finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice... To see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel, they are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Verse 11, then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right and, and of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes for which the golden oil drains? And then he answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. So he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Wow. I mean, can you get that picture in your head with me? It's amazing to think that you're awakened out of a deep sleep as the prophet of God and the Lord begins to put all of this vision into your head. You begin to see what God is projecting from heaven in your own eyes, your, your, your own eyes are, are visualizing, you're seeing, you're getting this vision from God. And man, I, I don't blame Zechariah. I, I would have some trouble understanding all of this as well. 
But the right thing to do when you don't understand what's going on is to what? Ask. And I love how over and over here again, he says, my Lord, what is this? My Lord, what is this? And then the Lord begins to explain it to him. We're going to walk through that this morning. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel through the prophet Zechariah for the assignment on his life. And if you're taking notes, please write this down. These are the words of God for you today for the assignment on your life. Now, folks, whether you realize it or not, admit it or not, life has a purpose. Amen? We are not just here on this planet by some cosmic accident. There is a divine creator, our great God, who lovingly and purposefully created each of us and has a specific and a divine assignment and calling on each of our lives. And for some people, they can't even begin to fathom that's a reality. But look at me right now. I'm here to remind you, as a preacher of the gospel, that is the truth about your life. Whether you've disqualified or discounted yourself in the past, do not do that any longer. God has a reason and a season for your life. Amen? Turn to somebody and say, this is my season. Go ahead, tell them that right now. Say, this is my season. But here's, here's where the trouble, here's where the rub comes in, as we like to say. The, the trouble is that so many do not realize or so many lose sight of that or get discouraged and tend to give up on it. But let me, let me remind you today, it is too valuable to forfeit and to not fulfill. And what I'm talking about, again, is the purpose and the calling on each one of our lives. So today, we're going to look at an example of, of that so that we can learn from God's Word how we can fulfill the calling on our lives. Now, here's the backstory of why this message came from God through the prophet Zechariah to Zerubbabel. I want you to, to take a gander at, at writing that down in your notes. Zerubbabel, which is a mouthful again, and I'm going to have to say it about 50 times in this service and about 100 times next service probably. Zerubbabel was the people's leader of the day, Right? He was the one that God had in charge of his people there in Jerusalem in this moment in history. Now, now look at me again for a minute. I don't want to lose you today. We are seeing played out before our very eyes, not only in this nation, but its ripple effects around the world, just how important leadership is. And I'm talking about good, godly leadership. I'm talking about a leadership that will rise up and honor God and protect the people and lovingly lead them by serving them in the right way. We are lacking that right now. Huge. And I'm not talking about Democrat, Republican, Libertarian. I'm talking about people who will rise up and honor God and follow him no matter what little letter is in front of their names. That is beside the point. I'm talking about a leader that will dare to lead righteously. The Bible says when the, when the land is led with righteousness, it will prosper. When it is not, it will falter. And man, how important that is. And Zerubbabel was the man who was leading God's people in this moment in history. And what we find out is that he had the responsibility to finish the work of, get this, rebuilding the temple of God. After the exiles had returned from Babylon at this stage of history. But the work had ground to a halt and had been on hold for years and years and years now. How many of you know there's nothing sadder to see a project that just stops and it sits there and it sits there. How many of you remember back in, in the 2007, 2006, 7, 8 range when the housing market collapsed? How many of you remember riding by neighborhoods where these builders had, had risked everything and had, had, had ventured out to build these huge neighborhoods and, and they had so much money borrowed and, and they, were, they were counting on the economy staying good and the housing market staying strong and being able to finish these houses. But it fell apart and they went bankrupt and could not finish. And you would drive by these neighborhoods day after day, month after month, year after year and see just these houses, these skeletons just dilapidated and falling apart. You can picture that because you've seen that. Picture the house of God in this same situation. It had been started. There was a mountain of rubble. There was all kinds of stuff there that needed to be repaired. But it had come to a, a terrible stop. The work of rebuilding the temple was massive. 
You add to, add to the kickstart here that's going on, and, and it seemed like a great mountain. And here God promised that by his spirit, the great mountain would be what? Leveled out and made flat. What a word for us today, church, that God will level every obstacle that stands in our way. And some of you desperately need to be reminded of that today. That no matter what it is that's facing you, God has it under control and will take care of it. Now, in this particular great mountain, it it was literally a mountain of rubble at the temple site. And that rubble would need to be removed and the work would need to carry on and be finished. And here's what's going on more than anything else. God, by his spirit, is reminding his leader, you're the man. You're the one. I have chosen you for this assignment. And here's what I want us to know as Connections Church today. That I believe with all of my heart, the Holy Spirit is pointing at each one of us and saying, you're the one. You're the man. You're the woman. You're the teenager. I have chosen you for a particular assignment. I have called you for such a time as this. And now I am charging you to rise up above everything that has halted the progress in and through your life and move past that and go to the finish line. I believe that with everything I am and standing up here today. You see, Zerubbabel needed stirring up to carry on the work. And God gives him some amazing encouragement. And again, there in in chapter 4, he says, So he answered to me and says, This is the word of the Lord to you, Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What a word to him. And what a word to us as God's people here in 2021. And I want you to write this down. Church, a word from God can and will change everything. I want to repeat that. A word from God can and will change everything. And I know that many of you need a word from God today for your own life. You need a kickstart. You need a reminder, some divine encouragement, a clear, clear word from God. Because number one, today I just want to simply give you four things. Many of you are tempted to be discouraged or maybe you're already there. I really believe that some of you are living in this valley of discouragement that maybe you've been camped out there for a long, long time. For Zerubbabel, he and so many others were discouraged because of the condition of their temple. Now, 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 don't forget what a temple is back in this day and time. It's just like what we're in right now. It was their place of worship to the Lord. It was, it was in ruins and had been for at least 20 years. How many of you agree with me? 20 years is a pretty long stretch of time. Yeah, 20 years ago, I was 23. My math's a little fuzzy. I might have been 33. Uh, 20 years is a long time to be without a church. Now think about this. We have this wonderful place to come and worship God together that we call our church building. We're the church, right? Living temples. But what if we had no place to come and gather? What if there was no house of God for his glory and his honor there? And for 20 years, that's what was going on here in Jerusalem for the people. Once upon a time, he had dug and laid a foundation. And he started the project. But fast forward 20 years and nothing, nothing of a finish has even come close to happening. Man, that can get you really discouraged, right? I mean, mean, we can relate to this with New Year's resolutions, right? Oh, this is going to be a great year for me. I'm going to change a lot of things that need to be changed in my life. Man, I'm writing down all of these resolutions. These things are going to be turned around in my life. And and I'm going to make this list. And I'm going to stick to them and, and, and really go after them. I'm going to make them happen. And by the end of the new year, everything is going to be completely different in my life. It's going to be different because I'm going to work hard at it. I'm going to be dedicated to it. And in three weeks, it's all over with. You didn't have the stick to itiveness that, that you needed. You didn't have the commitment. You didn't work at it. You didn't have the discipline. And man, what a discouraging thing that can be. Listen, I want to lovingly but strongly remind us all that the desire here for Zerubbabel is to build God's house. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, that should be our desire and passion as well. 
Why? To bring God glory and worship as our top priority and our top passion. That we want to see God's house. And when we say God's house, here's what we really mean. God's kingdom flourish. We want to see him high and lifted up. We want to see him glorified and honored in worship in his rightful place. And that is the King of kings and Lord of lords being declared here in Belmont, North Carolina and around the world. That should be our desire. Zerubbabel had a passion, but he had gotten discouraged. He had gotten down. Things hadn't went like he had hoped they would. And so all of a sudden, man, he finds himself in this 20-year pattern of not getting it done, what God had called him to get done. And we can relate to that. How often have we kind of gotten stuck somewhere? We had great intentions. We had great motives. We had great desires. Start out with a great ball of fire, as Jerry Lee Lewis used to sing. But the fire fizzled. And the discouragement set in. And next thing you know, we find ourselves fast forward years down the road. And it's not done. And that's what we see here. As people of God, I know that he has planted things in our hearts and our lives. As well, to do all we can do. To accomplish the task of building God's kingdom. So I ask you this right now. What is your vision? What is your personal vision? What is your heart? What, what, what is your need to, to see that happen? What do you need to, to finish to complete what God has called you to? I had a conversation this week with someone who said, man, God has called me to this certain thing and I've, I've kind of run from it, I've battled it, I've kind of kind of hid from it, I've kind of kind of just walked away and, and I can't any longer because I feel the Holy Spirit just urging me and pushing me and, and reminding me, this is who you are. So I ask every one of us in this room and those of you watching right now, what is your vision? What has God put on your heart? What has he been speaking to you and over your life and saying, this is why I created you. This is your purpose. This is your reason for being here on this planet right now. Because I dare to say that, that whatever that is, that right now you may be in some trouble with making that happen and getting to the finish line on that and seeing that accomplished just like we see here with Zerubbabel. Here's what I ask and pray, that we see God's heart for these last days, <laughs> right? That we really see God's heart for these last days. What does he want for us and from us, individually and collectively as the church? What is our modern day call to action by God as his people? What is it that he is speaking, charging, and challenging us with? Now, my belief and conviction is that we exist by mission as a fire exists by burning, as someone once said. That Jesus calls us to be fishers of men, and this means that we are commercial trawlers, not just Sunday anglers, if you know the difference. That we're not just exalting Jesus on Sunday and living like hell the rest of the week. That no, every day we are about the Father's business. Every day we're out there with the fishing gear and the tackle, and we're casting, and we're reeling, and we're working, and we're catching fish. We are fishers of men. As Jesus said to those first disciples. That it's not just a once a week activity or, or a hobby. That, that, that I believe that, that for such a time as this. God is calling us to keep on presenting and preaching the gospel boldly to the world around us. And to push back the decay by being salt on this earth. To bring glory and worship to the Lord. Especially in the dark days that we're living in. That we are to be light unto the people around us. To go out to see a, a last day's harvest of lost people coming to Jesus like never before. And please hear me today. We are all unique and have amazing varied calls on us to help make all of these things happen as the church. Do you believe that? That you don't have to have the exact calling that I have to, to do this to pastor a church, to get up with a microphone. As a matter of fact, you get more reach than I get probably. You see more people in the circles that I will never, ever touch probably. You get to be a part of influencing them and sharing the gospel with them and preaching the word to them in your own way, the way that God designed, created, and put you together and gave you the abilities to do so. 
But here's the thing. Are we about the Father's business? Are we diligent in the call on our lives? Or have we gotten to a place like Zerubbabel where maybe we got discouraged and said, you know what? It just can't be done. Or I don't, I'm not the person to do it. Or I just don't know what to do. Or I just, I give up. Whatever the case is, I love that the God of heaven will show up and wake somebody up and say, Zachariah, I need you to go because I have somebody who's wallowing in discouragement and I need to resurrect the hope in their lives and recharge them again and send them out to finish the task. And he'll do that to us. He'll send somebody to stir us up and to remind us of who we are and whose we are and the calling on our lives to finish the task. I'm in a place in my life that right now God's stirring something in me that, hey, we are marching towards the finish line and we all need to be diligent and be reminded and be about God's business of preaching the gospel to a lost and dying world and everything else is just fluff. We need... To be resurrected from our discouragement. When we aren't necessarily seeing the things that we would like to see happen in our callings. What can happen at times, and this is a part of the reminder, is that we are tempted to use worldly means. And this is a strong reminder but remember, God said through his prophet, not by might, nor by power. On more than 100 occasions in the Old Testament, it uses the word might to refer to collective strength. To armies or forces or warriors or fighting men, the, the armies of Pharaoh or, or, the, or, or of Israel or Babylon and anything God calls us to, to do for him, if we put our trust in might, let me just tell you right now, we're going to be wasting our time. Because it's not by might of numbers. If we put our trust in numbers and sheer human effort, that will count for nothing. But our trust must be in God alone. Psalm chapter 20 verse 6 puts it like this. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. I love that, man. He saves his anointed. He covers them, keeps them, protects them. And he answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses. David declared, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's where our trust is. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. I believe that's a word over us as American Christians today. That we need to trust in the right hand saving power of our great God. And not put our trust in anything else that this world has to offer. He alone will save us. He alone will empower us. So it's not by might of, of numbers. It's not by might of money. Man, it's good to belong to a church that can pay its bills. Good to belong to a church that has some resources to, to do outreach with and, 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 and help and reach out to the community and, and, and cover needs of people. It's good to have all those things. But let me just remind you this morning, not enough money in this world to buy conversions to Jesus Christ. We can't purchase salvation for anybody by our money or our finances. But what we can do is use those things for the glory of God and go out and live in the anointing and the fullness and the power of God's Holy Spirit and quit playing games with this world and stand strong for Jesus Christ and be reminded of who we are and whose we are and why we're here, church. So it's not by the might of money, although money helps us build buildings and have resources and do those things. But that's not what it's all about. It's about his majesty, not his money. Not by might of new technology or lots of activities. These things are good. Not by any of that. Not by human wisdom or hard work. Even though I'm reminded that, you know what, we just, we just don't sit back when God puts a vision or a calling on our lives. So don't get me wrong, we don't just put our feet up and expect God to save Gaston County without us playing our part, right? Without us partnering with him and saying, putting feet to the, to the vision, putting feet to the mission, and going out there and being the hands and the feet of who? Of Jesus Christ himself. It's a partnership, church. It's not a one-sided affair. You ever been in a one-sided relationship? That just stinks. It's terrible. If you're the one that's doing all the work to keep the relationship alive and going everything, it's just, it's, it's awful. 
But when we show up, God shows up and great things happen, miracles take place, and lives are changed for eternity. And that's exactly what we're to be about. So it's not just by human effort, but it's effort partnered with anointing and power. I've always said it this way, and it's, it's pretty complicated, so you, you might want to just focus real, real, real good here. We do our part. God does his part. It's a win-win. I know that's tough to figure. <laughs> Not really. It's simple. I'm being facetious here. <sighs> Not by might nor by power. And can I share something else? It's not by talent or ability either. I've known a lot of people in my day and time in church that come in and had more talent in their little finger than I had in my whole body. But as I watched their lives, I, I, I realized something. They relied on that talent alone and not the anointing. I'll hear people come in and talk about people who, who get up and sing because that's one of the most visual and, and, and you know, hearing things that, that it's just apparent who, who has real talent with, with vocals and, and, and those kind of things. And man, just they're like, oh man, they're such a great singer. And I've heard some great singers in my day and time in church, right? You have too. But I've heard some great singers and I've heard some singers who had the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something. I'll take the anointing every single day over great talent. Because that makes a difference. And I'm going to tell you, if we try in our own abilities and our own talents to, to win the world for Christ or, or to do the, the mission that he's called us to, we will fall on our faces. We'll run out of gas. Because in and of ourselves and even the talents that God blesses us with, we just don't have enough to sustain anything that's going to save somebody's soul. So talent is, is a good thing. Ability is a good thing. But it's a right thing when it's coupled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus Christ. Before I get up and speak to anybody, whether it's this church, any church, any group that I'm invited to speak to, I always pray this prayer. Lord, give me your boldness and your anointing because without it, we're all in trouble. I've got nothing of myself that I can give to these wonderful people, but you've got everything of the resources of heaven that you can bring and change their lives and my life, God. It's not me speaking, it's God speaking through me, and I don't say that lightly. I say that with a reverence and an understanding that, man, without him showing up, we're all in trouble because as much as I love you, as much as I care about you and my own human abilities, it's not enough. It's the anointing of God through the Holy Spirit that brings about everything, everything we all have need of. And we've got to be vessels of the anointing. Third thing is this. What I'm trying to convey is that God's work must be done in God's way. The, the last part of that verse, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There's the key. Write that down. By the Spirit of God, all these things will be accomplished. Not by my might or, might or ability or, or talent or anything else. My money, my resources, none of that. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, pretty much so the same thing. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of, of this world. But they are mighty in God for what? The pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that wants to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. People talking about, what are we going to do in the world today, Pastor? What, what, what do we do as Christians? How do we, how do we battle this? How do we combat it? On our knees. In prayer, standing bold, standing strong, fighting the good fight with the weapons of heaven, not what's available down on this earth. That's the calling. God works through his Holy Spirit in order for the work to be done. Church, he uses the power. The dunamis, remember that from a couple of weeks ago? The dynamic, dynamite power which comes from the Holy Spirit. We as his servants submit to the Spirit if we want to be used of God. Think of all the Old Testament saints who are used of God. They, they submitted to the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives to commit to and to finish the task of ministry that they were given as assignment. Samson was full of the Holy Spirit when he took down the temple to the columns. And Saul was full of the Spirit as he prophesied. And Samuel was full of the Spirit when he judged Israel. And Elijah submitted to the Spirit to do all the mighty miracles that God worked in and through his life. 
And on and on and on the list goes. Human effort without the supply of the oil of the Holy Spirit would burn itself out. (laughs) What the golden olive oil was to the seven fluted oil lamps, the Spirit of God is to all aspects of any work done in and through his name. God's work done in God's ways will never lack God's provision or power. What about it? God's work done in God's way will never lack God's provision or power. Those who resist this principle will learn the hard way that they will be powerless to do God's work. We have to submit to the Holy Spirit if we're going to get any of God's work done. Yes, there is a place for mission. Yes, there is a place for vision and for strategy and for structure. However, the ultimate work of God will only be accomplished by each one of us submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit fully. Come Holy Spirit. We're talking this this series is called Spirit Life. And if you haven't gotten it in the first three and a half weeks now, then I'm, I'm afraid you may never get it, but I pray that you get it. That we don't walk in the flesh. We don't live in the flesh. We don't do battle in the flesh. We don't pray in the flesh. We don't worship in the flesh. We don't carry ourselves in the flesh. We don't preach in the flesh. We are spirit living beings. And we got to be full. To overflowing of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. If not, we're missing the power. And the resources that all of heaven will bring to us. So what do I submit? Because the ultimate work of God will only be accomplished by each one of us submitting ourselves fully to the Holy Spirit. For some, you need to submit your selfishness. That's that's hard to hear. So I'll repeat it again. For some, you need to submit and surrender your selfishness. To others, you need to submit and surrender your hurt. I've been there on that one. Stuck in hurt, full of anger and all that other poisonous junk. This happened, that that happened, they did this, they did, it, it just, it hurts. And we're not diminishing your hurt. We're not pretending it didn't happen and, and, and doesn't exist. But what we're saying is this, bring it to the Lord and say, God, I give it to you. I can't, I was never built to carry hurt. So Lord, it's yours, take it from my life, I I'm stuck in it. What about fear? So many people today are stuck in fear. They're trapped. They're they're paralyzed by fear. To the point that they can't take a step forward. We've seen it all through the word. We've seen it in our lives. We've seen it in our neighborhoods, our workplaces. We've seen it in our churches. People are filled with fear. Paul said to be absent from this body is to be with Christ. What else should make us afraid? If we live, we win. If we die, we win. It's a win-win situation. So all the other stuff that that is underneath death, (laughs) why be afraid of that? Now, I'm not talking radical extreme, but what I am talking is radical extreme. That we truly believe what the Word of God actually says. How dare us as Christians even think about doing that, but that's the calling that we have. To be absent from this body is to be with Christ. He said, if I, if I remain here, I preach the gospel. God is with me. If I go home, I'm with him in heaven. It's a win-win. Fear, what about apathy? I believe this is one of the greatest enemies of the church of the 20th, 21st century is apathy. We just settled in. We just do our thing. We just show up to church a, a time or two each week and, and, and punch the clock, so to speak. We get our time card. Yep, I came. Okay, now I can do what I want the rest of the week. I got my time in at church. No! We just get in a groove. We get apathetic. We get lethargic. We just get, get oblivious to the needs around us and the people that are dying and going to hell. Yes, there is a hell. Contrary to what many people want to say today. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, as the old word used to say. Apathy. Get trapped in our own little worlds. Back to selfishness. (laughs) Wake us up, Lord Jesus. What is it we need to submit to the Holy Spirit? To get what he wants us to get done, done. Folks, we are conduits of God's Spirit vessels for him to work in and through and for that to happen look look at me for another moment it takes this surrender 
My life is not my own. I belong to you, Lord. I surrender all. With everything that's happened in Afghanistan the last several weeks, some statements have been put out on social media that, that this weekend, that, that today, there will be people in that nation that still gather to lift up the name of Christ. Listen, listen to me. Knowing that their lives could be taken if they are found out. And they still go. And they still worship. Here in America, well, it's so easy. <laughs> So convenient. We've got air conditioning. Man, glad for air conditioning day, right? Turn to somebody and say, I feel pretty comfortable. How about you? We got these padded pews and this carpet on the floor. <laughs> Not in this church. I'm just kidding. You're like, what happened to it? Where did it go together? Still, we got padded chairs. That's something, right? <laughs> what about it, though? Would we survive as a Christian in a nation like Afghanistan? <laughs> big thought, big question, big idea. What about it? Would we be willing to risk all to go assemble with the saints? Knowing that we, we just might be assembling with the saints up there very quickly if we do. And yet when we're asked to surrender some seemingly minor stuff <laughs> to see the fullness of God's Spirit come and dwell in us and through us, I don't know about that, Pastor. That's asking a whole lot. <laughs> Never taught Sunday school or kept nursery before. <laughs> Sorry. I let that slip. What is it? As we close, I want to give you two charges. The first one is this. We read about in, in chapter 14, don't let small beginnings keep you from the great things to come. Zerubbabel was challenged in here and said, don't despise the small beginnings. Uh, you know, don't, don't get down because it's, it's small. It's not, not where it, 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 you want it to be and I want it to be. It's not, the temple's not there in its grandeur and glory as of yet. You've just got a foundation, but, but don't, don't get down and don't quit because of the small things. Don't despise the day of small things. How many of you ordered anything from Amazon this week? I don't do that, but I hear tell people do because I'm terrible with technology. Raise your hands, keep them up. You ordered anything from Amazon this week? What about in the past month? You raise your hands and, and keep them up stuff. You know, what I did do is we ordered toilet paper from Sam's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not because we was trying to get, get, a, get ahead of the game and, and get, stock, stock it up. We were just running low. It, don't, 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 you know, don't think that. Did you, did you know that, that Amazon, the company... Started by Jeff Bezos, is that how you pronounce his name? Started in his garage. And now they've taken over the world. I mean, you Amazon trucks everywhere and warehouses and distribution centers and, you know. So God says, don't despise the day of small things. Here's what I want to remind you of of that. In many of God's people... He uses a powerful season of small things. Those days are not a mistake, nor are they a punishment. But here's what they are. They are days of priceless shaping and preparation. So don't despise the day of small things. And the second charge to you this morning is this. Our source never runs out. Zechariah had to ask, well, what's the deal with the, the lampstands and the, the tree on the right and the tree on the left, the olive tree? You know that oil is representation of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. That's, oil represents the Holy Spirit. And, and olive trees, they press the oil. How many of you have olive oil for cooking in this room? Anybody? Anybody still cook in this room? It's, it's hard to find anybody that actually cooks and doesn't go through a drive through anymore. But the picture there, and this man, this just lit me up when I was going through it this week. Is a tree on the right and a tree on the left. They're hooked to the lampstands. 
is representative of the Holy Spirit being connected to us and that vat of oil never running out and just continually flowing in us and through us and in us and through us as we are connected to the vine as we talked about last week. So that's the great news. It would be like your car. How many of you had to stop and put gas in your vehicle this week? How many of you, like me, have a big truck that just drinks gas and you had to stop a couple times and put gas in your vehicle this week? What if you never had to stop and put gas in your vehicle? What if you had a connected source that just was attached to your vehicle and you never had to stop at the gas pump. You didn't have to fight them long lines at Sam's for the cheapest gas in town now that everything's just going through the roof price-wise. You have to be lined up through the parking lot just, just sitting there waiting to put gas in your car to save five cents over the, 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 the station out on the boulevard. But you just drove and there was a never-ending supply of gasoline that just kept coming and coming and coming into your vehicle. How nice would that be, Right? You would save money because some of you, when you stop and fill up with gas, you go in the store and get you a big gulp and some crackers and, and candy bars and stuff, and you spent 10 extra bucks just like that. See this today. That in the word from the Lord to Zechariah for Zerubbabel, he's saying to him, you get back to the task. You get back to the mission. You fulfill the vision that I put on your heart to build that temple. And I am going to supply you continuously with the power of the Holy Spirit that will never run out. Man, that did something for me and it should do something for you. That when you leave this place as a child of God... The Holy Spirit goes with you and he's continually pouring into your life as you go in Jesus. It will never run dry. Your tank will be filled continually. Would you close your eyes with me for just a moment? Some of you needed to hear this today desperately because some of you, I really believe with all my heart, were about this close and you can't see it, but I'm putting, holding my fingers together to throwing in the towel and saying, you know what, it's never going to happen. I was mistaken. It was not me that God can do this through whatever way you were going to disqualify and discount yourself and, and be done with it. No. Spirit life says that I have a resource that will never run dry. That I am continually being filled with the Holy Spirit as I understand and receive that in my life and allow Him to pour into and through my life. Spirit life says, I understand very clearly that's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God that He will accomplish all that He has created me for and called me to. So, as a wake up call, what do you need to surrender? What do you need to see happen to get you back on track to, to go back to building the temple, so to speak, as, as was Zerubbabel's call? Because whatever it is, God is here to meet with you personally. So I ask you this morning, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I just need, I just need to come and surrender. Fear, apathy, hurt, discouragement, whatever it may be. I, I just want you to step from where you're at and come and meet me right here and let's pray together and say say Lord today is my day you just need to be full of the Holy Spirit and power and fire would you just come and stand here and meet me and let's pray together whatever it is would you just begin to move now and I know that, that God's dealing with people across this room and outside of it right now so don't just sit there and let this opportunity slip by you would you just come now and stand and say say, Pastor pray for me pray for me I, I, I need a refreshing I need a refueling. I need to know and understand and live in that power and that fullness to fulfill the calling, the vision, the mission. I, I, maybe you've run from it. Maybe you've been afraid of, of, of saying, God, I, I could never do that just like I did at one time in my life. Lord, I can never get up in front of people and speak and, and, and preach and do that kind of thing. That's not me. And, and the crazy thing is, God said, that's exactly you. Surrender and see what I do. 
How many others will come and join these that have already taken that big step and moved to the front of this church to, to surrender whatever it is to the Lord right now? How many of you still need to be here? I'm, I'm, I just feel in my heart there's a couple more folks that, that the Holy Spirit is saying, you come and you come and you come. So would you make your move now? Make your move now. This is your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many others? Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. And here's what I want to ask. As more are still coming to surround this altar, and surrender something in their lives, some, whatever it is the Holy Spirit is, is putting His hand on and, and speaking to your heart. I want the rest of you that, that aren't up here for this to come and be up here with this. I want the rest of you to come and say, I'm going to stand with my brothers and sisters. I'm going to stand with my family. I'm going to stand with the people of God who are here to see God do a great work. Would you come now and surround and come beside and behind and, 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 and touch and, and, and lay hands on them and, and partner with them right now. As we partner with the Holy Spirit and His power to come and change lives. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we stand in agreement this morning that every person who made a move to come to the front of this church, God, are your children who were divinely and uniquely created by you, God, for a purpose and a plan for such a time as this. And Lord, we know, we know from experience that, that it's tough to move forward towards the vision, God, sometimes, that discouragement will set in and disappointment will set in and sometimes we'll say, God, how in the world could this be the way? I never pictured it like this, God. I didn't see it going like this. And God says, trust me. Trust me. Just follow me. Just, just stay with me. I have it all in the palm of my hand and I can take whatever you've been through and turn it for my glory and your good. For my purposes are higher than you would ever think or imagine. And I will fulfill these things in and through your life. So Father, right now, let the anointing come. Let the power come. Let the fullness come of the Holy Spirit dwelling richly and mightily in us and through us, God. For every one of these young people and adults who came and said, Jesus, I surrender this. I give up fear. I give up apathy. I give up hurt, God. Whatever has been in their lives, God, that would discourage and then stop your work, God. We give it up today. We surrender it in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you. Thank you for doing a work, for challenging us and charging us to rise up as a people of God in these last days, in your anointing and in your power, God. And magnify the King of kings and the Lord of lords as you are worthy. You are worthy, Jesus. God, we're not playing church here at Connections. We're not playing games here at this church, God. But we are seeking you. We are seeking you in your fullness to be all that you have created us to be today. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving yourself to us. Thank you for your continual flow in our lives of the Spirit. If you would just remain down here at this altar, we're going to close with this anthem of worship together. And I want you to sing this song as you finish your time here in prayer like you've never, ever sang it out before. We are declaring these things today in our great God. We see it, Lord. We see revival. We see your power, God, your goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.